It's my pleasure to introduce Daniela Maranazzo. Um, and he is obviously in Venice now, but um, in, in his position, he's a, a research professor of data analysis at Ghent University in, in Belgium. Um, he's trained as a statistical physicist. So he's, he's a technical person who got interested in the brain. And we yep. need a lot, we need people like that. Um, and, uh, you know, so he's, he's been doing a lot of interesting work uh, looking at dynamics. Uh, and he's going to be sharing uh, some of that uh, with us today uh, in his talk uh, on connectivity through dynamics, looking at surprise and variance reduction. So um, just as a reminder, um, uh, this is the Brain Space Initiative, and um, we're going to have uh, Daniela present his talk. And then afterwards, we'll have time for Q&A. Um, and during the Q&A, if you want to ask a question you know, verbally, just uh, message us in the chat panel and we can unmute you for that. Or if you prefer, you can just uh, write questions during the talk um, in the chat and then we, will, uh, we can ask those on your behalf. So, uh, so without further ado, uh, Daniela, I will let you take it away from here. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for uh, setting this initiative up and for thinking of me. So yeah, good that uh, you reminded that this is the Brain Space Initiative because uh, my talk, uh, as you said, is a bit more on the on the technical side. But still, I hope that I can give you, let's say, some ideas of the tools uh, and hopefully how we can use it and when we use it, uh, what what we are after. So when we apply it to the brain, even though, strictly yeah. speaking, what I uh, described today, it can be applicable to a variety of other dynamical uh, systems. Technical is good. Technical is good. It's great. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, okay. So uh, again, and also uh, as my subtitle said, uh, this is uh, something which, of course, uh, reflects um, what I've done so far and what I had the the, the chance to. Uh, to think about. So, of course, uh, I don't mean to uh, be disrespectful or to uh, 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 omit uh, other people's work or so, or other people's interpretation. Uh, we are open for discussions and I hope it will be the case. Still, uh, let me know if there is something that I miss or something that goes against uh, uh, someone's previous experience or ideas about this. So. Uh, thanks. Uh, I will start with uh, uh, how we started to call correlation in neuroscience, because of course this is part of the uh, somehow uh, an issue of how we uh, bridge between mathematical quantities and uh, their interpretation when we apply to the brain. So indeed, uh, what is 90% of the time um, a Pearson correlation coefficient and the other 10% a mixture of other statistical dependencies, we started to call uh, functional connectivity indeed. So uh, this is the name we give to, to correlation, which is uh, definitely fine, but again, is instructive of how we need to bridge concepts and their application or maps and territories. Um, back in time, when I uh, started in this field of connectivity, uh, there was the idea, okay, well, you have uh, synchronization, you have coherence, you have correlation, which are not uh, uh, directional. And then if you want to go to the directional, then you have to use other methods, which can be uh, Granger causality, transfer entropy, dynamic causal modeling or so. So uh, like if it was, let's say, an addition in terms of complexity, which maybe it is, but on the other hand, we need to keep it in mind why and uh, uh, to which system we apply this kind of measure. And so, uh, indeed, the functional links and even those uh, derived from symmetric measures like uh, correlations, uh, at some level, they suppose some directionality. So, uh, we can have, uh, let's say, a directionality from uh, one part to the other and vice versa, but uh, it's difficult to have such a thing which is completely a-directional. So, we have a mechanism in, in one sense. And somehow, uh, sometimes we can go beyond this and uh, refer to these mechanisms uh, as causality. And so uh, here is where uh, problems start because uh, there is a huge debate on what we are allowed to call uh, causality and whether the methods define it 
or uh, the interpretation defines it. So, uh, what I will try to say today that is that um, uh, functional connectivity is causal in uh, this main uh, direction. So, uh, if we say, well, okay, let's just call functional connectivity as the pure mathematical thing, then uh, we run the risk of impoverishing a bit our uh, purpose. So we say, well, okay, in that case, we can just call it correlation and then we are happy with that, which uh, again, is not a matter of nomenclature, but still we need to take into account uh, the distinction between the properties of interest from the methods used to infer these uh, properties. So the map versus a territory uh, dichotomy. Uh, so the phenomenon of theoretical interest in uh, Functional connectivity research, so uh, statistical dependencies investigated in neuroimaging, let's say, is ultimately the causal interaction so in terms of mechanism or so among uh, neural entities. So I'm not saying that uh, a correlation can solve the causality or can take into account of all the counterfactuals because we know that is not the case. On the other hand, we'll see how with the proper mindset and knowing the, the promises and the pitfalls of our methods, we can go in that direction. So answer causal questions. And also, uh, this is just a tongue in cheek remark to people who say, well, no, I'm super happy with my correlations, but I will never touch upon uh, grandeur causality or dynamic causal modeling because there, uh, there is this causality thing or so. But on the other hand, these people still work within a causal inference framework because uh, they, we uh, refer, we use causal languages when we say, okay, this network encodes this, um, uh, this network is modulated by disease, or I remove the global signal because uh, uh, it causes this thing, and so on. Uh, so uh, here we start from a figure uh, from a recent paper we, we published a while ago. Uh, last year, in which we try to uh, uh, we try to explain in which sense uh, functional connectivity can help in bridging the levels towards um, the causal uh, answers. Let's say so. We have different levels. We have the level of the neural mechanism we want to characterize, and then we have the level of observation. So the data that we measure at the sensors, which can be EEG, MEG sensors, and uh, or um, fMRI uh, activity at each uh, voxel. And then uh, we measure some activity and we measure some uh, dependencies here. And then we have the third step, which is uh, the most relevant in this case, which is the level of inference. So how this observation uh, with all their problems, confounders and so can help to uh, make some inference about the neural level, which you want to characterize. And so we have estimated neural entities, estimated neural activities, and then our uh, functional connectivity measures, which can be significant or not significant according to our um, criteria and our design. And this is a third level that we want to, to join. Uh, a mathematical or engineering way of looking at this uh, type of a catalyzation is state space. And uh, I mentioned this here because it will be then relevant from the practical point of view when I will describe some of the measures later. So the state space formulation is a, a, a formulation in which you have uh, two or more levels. So typically you have the level of dynamics and then the level of observation. And so you try to uh, make a mapping or a transfer function between these two. So uh, there are at least two distinct ways one can think of uh, causalities, and this um, excludes so far uh, Aristotelic causality, and R. The first one is temporal precedence. So causes precede their consequence in time. And the second one is uh, more about the, the actual influence or the notion of control. So if we change the cause, we change the consequences. Um, once we uh, start from these two uh, definitions, uh, what can we expect from the methods which are called somehow causality in neuroscience? Either these measures can reflect effective connectivity, so 
can recapitulate the underlying physiological influences among different neural population. So, and this is what uh, uh, Carl Friesen and colleagues define uh, uh, in their framework, which involves, uh, which is, let's say, operationalized in the dynamic causal models. Or, on the other hand, we can have a different uh, but complementary goal to reflect uh, dynamical connectivity, which can also be uh, directed without uh, recapitulating, uh, so without having a generative model as the dynamic causal models. And so, in this case, in this uh, basket, we can throw all the statistical dependencies which are not based on generative models. And the, this uh, complementarity is useful because for example, the same underlying uh, structure can uh, give rise to different uh, dynamical connectivity patterns. So, for example, we know that uh, uh, the structural uh, connectivity matrix in the brain or the individual synapses uh, can uh, result in uh, a degeneration of dynamical patterns expressed on this uh, substrate. And also sometimes is unfeasible to measure all the relevant variables. This is a problem for both approaches, uh, both for the generative one and for the other, but this is something that we have to take into account. So uh, this comes, uh, by the way, from a nice review by uh, Steve Bresler and Anil Sat. So uh, what I will uh, uh, say to you today is how we can use information and how I put in quotation marks because I, I didn't define this uh, yet to navigate, uh, let's say, the uh, the, uh, the inference between different level and to better be informed when we want to answer some type of causal uh, questions. So we have, for example, uh, two uh, methods resulting in two observation. We have some properties and then we want to arrive uh, to answer a question about the brain in this case. So we have the state space of the hypothesis and we have the target theoretical properties. And so by looking at uh, the results of our uh, measures, uh, we want to say, okay, this hypothesis is more likely, this hypothesis is less likely, this hypothesis, uh, I observe these modulations probably for this reason, or I can exclude that this uh, can uh, result in this modulation and so on. In this case, we can uh, go, of course, in an incremental level towards our uh, solution of uh, defining the target theoretical properties. So uh, let's start by defining information uh, by the amount by which one variable, and this is really the wide sense, so an answer uh, to a question a piece of signal, measurements, etc., uh, reduces our uncertainty, or if you want, surprises us on the future of or the present of another variable. So uh, one way of quantifying this was uh, made by uh, Shannon uh, using uh, probability distributions and then using a logarithm with uh, a formula that we will see in a moment. But so the, for the moment, the important thing is that information is something related to our reduction of uncertainty. So, uh, simple example, uh, one variable which can take only two variables, zeros and one, one with probability p and one with probability one minus p. So, in this case, the entropy of this uh, simple uh, system is given by the sum of the two probabilities uh, multiplied by their logarithm. And this takes this uh, shape. And so the maximum uh, is at uh, p equals 0, 5, so uh, when the two events are equally probable. So we have no entropy when we always have 0 or no entropy when we always have 1. Uh, so we have no surprise at all if there is only one outcome with probability 1, and then our surprise increases when um, the probability of uh, one variable become less likely or the other become more likely and is maximized when they are equally likely. Uh, this brings to, uh, we can extend these to more values, slightly more complicated case, uh, four values with four probabilities all summing up to, to one again. So we want to determine the value of x with the minimum number of binary questions. So we can ask, is x equal to a? And then the probability is split in half. 
then is e equal to b and so on. And so in this case, uh, the, the entropy of this system is the expected number of binary questions uh, to solve this uh, issue. We can also have another strategy, ask is x equal d, then is x equal c, so going backwards. In this case, we have a different number in this case. So the entropy of this strategy is slightly uh, higher than the, the previous one. So we have learned that the order of our questions uh, matter somehow. And this is something which uh, is very well uh, expressed in the guess who game, in which you have to, to guess one uh, character starting uh, uh, by posing some questions. And so, for example, if you directly ask as a first question, is the person Alex? Then, of course, you have a lot of surprise reduction if you guess the first uh, uh, step. But typically, you do easier or other types of questions. For example, is it female or male? So in this case, we have many more uh, males than females. And so uh, you have more surprise uh, if uh, you uh, learn that the character is a female. So uh, you know more about the the future of uh, our uh, of your guests eventually and so the idea is what's the best question to to ask first uh, so the general statement by shannon is that the entropy of a system is a lower bound on the minimum expected number of binary questions required to determine the the value of that system uh, so the first code, the one with four variables, is said optimum with respect to the probability distribution of X. And uh, the entropy of X is a measure of the amount of information on average needed to describe this uh, random variable. So uh, what happens when we know the answer to a question and we want to know another? Uh, so we want to ask a second question. So this is the concept of joint uh, probability distributions, in this case of two variables. And so, for example, if we already know, know uh, who the character is, we don't get any more information asking whether they are uh, male or female. On the other hand, we gain some extra bits of information uh, if we try to look at joint information between uh, uh, color of the hair and uh, sex. Uh, yeah, just uh, to say that uh, gender equality is a great thing, and I really don't get me wrong. I really want this, uh, in particular for our field, is crucially important, and I hope we can uh, build a better world for our children. On the other hand, if we want to build uh, a better version of the guess who game, uh, the balance is not optimal because all the questions become much more equal. So I had. Uh, play this what with my kids uh, in the car last summer and it was not so interesting because they always ended up uh, winning at the same uh, point. But strive for diversity, it's really important. Now, um, when we want to quantify the entropy of a multivariate distribution, uh, we have, in this case, uh, this, uh, this formula. So we have the joint probability and the sum over the two values, x and y. So one can ask, is the entropy of x and y equal to the sum of the two entropies? Sorry, uh, there is a typo here. should be uh, h of x plus h of y. And this is true only for uh, independent variables. So, uh, the question that the joint entropy and conditional entropy want to answer is, what if we already know something about X? How does that change the surprise on the future of the system? So conditional entropy is the expected value of the entropies of the two condition distribution averaged over the conditioning random variable. So in this case, we have the entropy of Y condition to X, and we could have, on the other hand, the, the other way around, depends on which one we know first. Um, going back to our uh, guess who example, we can ask how much surprise remains on the identity once we know the sex of the character. And so uh, this is given by uh, this uh, conditional entropy of the identity condition to the sex. And then we have two conditional entropies. We have two individual entropies. 
we have the joint entropy, this one, and then we have this guy here. What is that? This is called the mutual information. Uh, the mutual information is equal basically to the sum of the two entropies uh, minus the, um, uh, the joint entropy, or if you want, is one of the two entropies minus the conditional entropy. And is a symmetrical quantity with respect to x and y. And quantifies the reduction in uncertainty of surprising one variable obtained from another. So in this case, the mutual information between uh, identity and sex is equal to the entropy of uh, the sex variable. On the other hand, the mutual information between uh, earring and sex when sex is female is uh, 0.2 bits. Again, some more information gained in this case. So, uh, mutual information is, let's say, an analogous of correlation for uh, most uh, cases. Uh, but uh, there are uh, some important differences. So the uh, the, the correlation assumes a linear uh, dependencies between the, the variables, which is not the case for the mutual information. Also, the correlation is bounded between uh, minus one and plus one. A mutual information is uh, has a lower bound zero, but has no uh, upper bound. And here we see some example of distribution, and we see in orange the correlation and in uh, purple the uh, the mutual information. Now, for two variables for which it makes sense to define both correlation and mutual information, so two variables which are linearly distributed, uh, the relationship between correlation and mutual information has its a U uh, shape. And this is helpful uh, because higher correlation correspond to uh, much higher values of uh, mutual information. And so, for example, in uh, mass univariate analysis, this increases uh, our uh, uh, power, let's say, the, the power of uh, finding uh, difference given a simple uh, contrast. So, uh, what now? We have uh, defined a set of tools which allow to detect relationship between variables, reveal patterns, and show how these relationship and patterns fluctuate in time. The important thing is that since we are working with probability distributions, uh, it doesn't matter. So the, vali uh, the variables does not necessarily have to uh, be of the same nature. So we don't need to have all EEG uh, signals, all fMRI signals, and so on. We can mix different uh, things. So for example, these are some examples, again, from a very nice uh, and uh, uh, educational paper by uh, Robin Ince and colleagues published in uh, Human Brain Mapping uh, some time ago, in which mutual information can be defined, for example, when each trial is a sample. So uh, another way of defining a T-contrast between uh, faces and scrambled faces. Or you can also have a situation in which you want to have some uh, univariate statistics on the scalp. Or here, uh, when we have three variables, two of them are uh, two sensors, and another one is uh, the, the luminance of a stimulus. So uh, again, here you have two continuous variables and one uh, discrete variable. So again, working with the probabilities allows to merge uh, several things. Also, by the way, the group of Vince has done quite some work in this in particular, uh, uh, fusing data from different modalities. So here uh, they had the characterization of uh, psychiatric disorders based on uh, different type of uh, neuroimaging data uh, and uh, behavioral data and uh, demographics and so on. So uh, what we, instead of conditioning of another variable, we condition on the past of the system. This brings to the family of uh, grandeur causal inter interactions, in which uh, causality is seen as a reduction in variance or, again, as a measure of uh, surprise. So, if we consider a dynamical system made of different units, uh, when we refer to a target system, which can be one of these units, uh, it doesn't matter which one, but here we call it Y to distinguish the target from the driver, but of course uh, we can scramble all of this. Uh, we want to uh, determine the, the present value of the system, and in particular of the target, 
given the past of the system. So we have a minus every time we consider the past and uh, no uh, superscript when we talk about the present. So considering the flow of time allows to study direct dynamic interaction within and between processes using uh, the, the conditioning approach that we studied so far. So this is a simplest case of just two variable, one driver and one target. This can be also multivariate uh, uh, units, but the important thing is that we have one driver and one uh, target. And so by looking at the past of the system, we want to predict the present. So the principle of Grange causality, which is also true for the so-called model-free estimation, even we'll see that there is no such a thing as model-free, is that the Granger cause precedes in time its effect, and the Granger cause contains unique information about the future values of the effect. So in the case of the dynamic process of two variables, we have this simple graph of information flow. So we have the internal dynamics of the two variables, and then we have directed dynamical interactions, which can be both zero lagged and lagged interactions. And we can probe uh, relationships of the Granger type using conditional independence or uh, conditional mutual information. So for example, the the influences in the Granger sense between the path of X and Y uh, is basically the uh, mutual information uh, between uh, the present of the target and the past of the driver condition to the past uh, of the target. And then we have the internal dynamics of Y. So uh, how much we can learn from the past of one variable to predict itself. So um, we can have a, the first the composition of this uh, uh, entropy value that we defined uh, a few uh, slides and minutes ago. The information generated by Y, so by the target variable, uh, is basically the information contained in the present of the process under study. And this can be divided in two parts. The unexplained information about the present of Y given the past of the system, and then uh, the information contained in the past of the system that can be used to predict the present of the target. So in this case, we can decompose the entropy into quantities, the prediction entropy and the unexplained information. Again, in terms of uh, conditional entropies and uh, mutual information. Now, the interesting part is this prediction entropy, which can which, uh, which can be further decomposed into uh, items. One is the so-called information storage or self-entropy, which describes basically the memory of the target system. So the information contained in the past of the target that can be used to predict its own present. On the other hand, the information transfer, uh, this uh, guy here from X to Y is called the transfer entropy and quantifies the information contained in the past of X, so in the past of the driver, that can be used to predict the present of the target above and beyond the information contained in the past of the target. This is very important uh, because if the two variables are not related, these two probabilities uh, are the same. So uh, this goes to one, the logarithm of one is zero, and we have no transfer entropy. Uh, and also, basically, uh, this uh, crucial distinction between correlation and transfer entropy. So when the system, uh, so uh, sorry, when the driver and the target are exactly the same, or uh, we have a clear uh, relationship between the two, we don't need anymore the driver to predict uh, the target. And uh, even if the correlation goes to one or to minus one, or even if the mutual information is maximized, the transfer entropy goes back to zero, unless we have some noise in the system. We can see this uh, with a simple example in which we have the information dynamics for uh, the simplest, if you want, dynamical system that we can uh, devise to uh, explain these things. So we have a bivariate Markov process in which one variable X has some memory. On the other hand, the variable Y has completely uh, no memory at all. And then we have some influences, lagged influences between X and Y. So in this case, 
we can uh, exactly compute the transition probabilities between the past and the present, uh, approximated to a certain lag in the past, and the fact of uh, being able to solve these systems uh, allows to uh, compute these quantities for different scenarios. So this is when we consider the information transfer from y to x. So this never happens here. So uh, for all the values of uh, the memory of x and for all the values of coupling, of course, we have no information transfer. On the other hand, what increases is the information storage of x when delta increases. So the system becomes uh, more and more deterministic as more and more memory of its own past x in this case. On the other hand, the slightly more interesting case is the information flow graph uh, when we want to consider the uh, information transfer from x to y. And this is what I was saying uh, to you before. So when uh, the system has no noise, so when the system is completely deterministic, uh, so when delta equals to 1, when the coupling becomes too strong, x became too similar to y, and so we don't need any more x to predict y, and the transfer entropy drops, which is not the case for higher values of noise. And similar things happen to the information storage. So we have these different decompositions, uh, different results of the decomposition between uh, predictive information, uh, transfer entropy, and uh, information storage. So to recap, we have a dynamical system, we have a statistical structure, and then we have a diagram of information dynamics. And with respect to a target system Y, the information storage uh, reflects the statistical dependencies about the target process arising from its own past, so it does not reflect Granger causal connections. On the other hand, the information transfer or transfer entropy does reflect Granger causal connections. Now, how do we estimate all these quantities? Uh, the simplest estimation is based on covariance, and uh, when the variables are uh, Gaussian, or when we assume that they are Gaussians, then we can compute conditional interdependencies based only on the covariance matrices. So the transfer entropy and the Granger causality in the sense are equal uh, about, uh, sorry, except a factor of two. And uh, we can have uh, basically from a vector autoregressive uh, representation of the system, we can compute all these uh, quantities. Another convenient thing is that we already have a, a test to assess the statistical significance, because in this case, the Fisher F test already tells us which uh, uh, interactions are significant and which are not. Uh, here is where the state space representation starts to become uh, really important. Because uh, if we uh, have a system made of different variables, in this case, uh, we can go beyond the target and the driver. We can also have some conditioning variables. And so we have a, a vector regressive representation of the system. The state space representation has a state equation and an observation equation and uh, allows to define uh, partial variances, so variances of the model excluding every time some uh, variables. And this is basically what leads to the definition of Granger causality. So comparing the model when all the variables are considered and the model when the candidate driver variable is removed by the model. The important thing is that the state space representation is closed under the formation of submodels. It means that we, can, we need to compute the coefficients of a model only once, and then we can compute all the different uh, submodels and all the different partial variances. Uh, this could be could seem like a, a just mathematical uh, trick, but uh, is more relevant than that in this sense, because um, first of all, uh, before saying is relevant, uh, the state space representation. Uh, allows for a family of description of dynamical system, which also involves, if you want, the, the dynamic causal model. So this is actually uh, a figure in a, a recent paper by uh, Carl Friesen et al. Uh, on a dynamic causal model from a racing state of MRI, in which he shows that indeed, starting from the state space model, you can have different uh, 
representation of the interdependencies of the dynamical system, both in time and in frequency domain, and eventually arrive to different quantities of uh, use, all starting from the state space model. So why uh, state space model representation helps in Granger causality? Uh, a while ago, there was this uh, paper published in uh, PNAS by uh, Stokes and Purden, which uh, was titled A Study of Problems Encountering Granger Causality from a Neuroscience Perspective. And the main idea was that the full model, so the model including the driver, is a vect vector to regressive moving average, when while the reduced model without the driver is simply vector to regressive. And by definition, the full model has a given order that you can detect with the Akaike criterion, uh, Bayesian criterion, and so on. On the other hand, the reduced model has infinite order because we don't know which kind of uh, complexity we have uh, reduced by removing one variable. So uh, what they shown in their paper is that uh, either with a small model order, you have a big bias in the estimation of Granger causality given the true dependencies, which are these ones in red. Or if you increase the model order, you have a huge dispersion. And so this was basically the tragedy which uh, uh, spurred yet another wave of uh, Granger causality bashing. On the other hand, with the state space representation, uh, the, the bias and variance are uh, reduced and the problem uh, ceases to exist. And uh, there were quite some uh, replies to that uh, paper. Uh, so now let's go back to our predictive multivariate model. So we have a system made of different variables. One of them is the target, one of them is the driver, and then we have all the other confounding variables. We have two conditional. So in this case, uh, we can define all kinds of partial variances in this case. And partial variances, if you want, are just uh, error variances from linear regression model when we uh, consider, uh, let's say, a linear assumption or a Gaussianly distributed variable. On the other hand, we can have estimation of distributions uh, when we don't want or we cannot assume uh, Gaussianity. And so uh, we need to work out our um, definition of probability distribution, uh, which uh, some people call them model free because you don't have a vector regressive model. On the other hand, uh, also probability distribution is a model of some sort. Anyway, uh, there are different ways to uh, compute these distributions uh, when we don't want to build an autoregressive model. So, for example, we can have uh, the binning approach, which suffers uh, from some bias, or you can have the so-called nearest neighbor estimation. So, in the dynamical space of the system, look uh, for how long uh, points of different variables stay together in the same uh, attractor, in the same uh, manifold of the dynamical trajectory of the system. Of course, uh, this uh, is hard as it sounds, especially because uh, it can occur in the course of dimensionality, because we need to explore a huge multidimensional space. There are some um, strategies to reduce this uh, course of dimensionality, which is, for example, the non-uniform embedding, just choosing some variables uh, with an iterative process which are, let's say, the most relevant every time. And this uh, indeed helps uh, to, to some extent. And it's still necessary when we cannot approximate the system with a Gaussian variable. On the other hand, it might be useful to consider the pros and the cons. You say, well, okay, but my system is not linear. Uh, certainly, but on the other hand, if uh, the system is not linear, but also you have a short and noisy data, either, okay, you close your shop and you go home, or you can say, well, okay, let's drop the non-linearity part and let's work with Gaussian variables, and still uh, you can have a description of the system rather than having to uh, estimate the probability distribution when you don't have enough the data to do it, and then uh, is another type of disaster, possibly uh, worse.
uh, state space models also uh, help the analysis across temporal scales because temporal scales, uh, uh, so going in um, uh, different temporal scales involves two steps typically. Uh, rescaling, which is basically averaging and then downsampling. So from this system, uh, you uh, first uh, average and then you downsample to this. The problem is that averaging and downsampling uh, lead to different uh, effects on uh, what you want to measure. On the other hand, state spaces help in this sense because um, state space models are also closed in uh, um, determining uh, influences or covariance matrices, if you want, at different temporal scales. So when you average and uh, downsample. So you need to estimate the parameter of uh, the vector autoregressive model only once, and then you can have all your uh, downsampled and reduced uh, models. And this is important because, for example, the averaging step introduces autocorrelations, so increases the storage, but does not change the Granger-like uh, influences. So the information transfer is uh, not altered. On the other hand, the downsampling step removes the autocorrelation, but elicits some scale-dependent uh, Granger causal interaction. And so uh, basically we have to transfer entropy peaks at some scales which are uh, compatible with the interaction delay. On the other hand, the c space model helps also in, uh, in this sense. Uh, just to finish, uh, we can extend this uh, decomposition, so uh, find the variables which are informative with respect to a target also to a higher order. So to find, okay, we know, for example, that X influences Y and also Z influences Y. But what about the joint effect of X and Z on Y? Uh, is it uh, independent? Are they synergistic? Are they redundant? So this is uh, just a, a, a diagram, how uh, the diagram that I introduced would look like for four variables. As you see that uh, it becomes beautiful, but also uh, complicated, both in the computation and in the interpretation. Uh, on the other hand, there are other uh, strategies to um, go to higher order uh, informative multiplets. So uh, starting uh, from uh, this work by uh, Bettencourt uh, in 2008, in which they proposed to uh, decompose mutual information with a tailor-like uh, expansion. So you find second order, third order, fourth order uh, mutual information uh, with a recursive step, which if you introduce a conditioning operator can become an expansion of transfer entropy and the conditioning operator commutes with these uh, tailored like operators. Or uh, recently, uh, Fernando Rosas and colleagues uh, introduced uh, a way of looking at high order inter, uh, interdependencies with a simple um, calculation called the O information, as again an extension of mutual information, which again we uh, adapted to the uh, lagged and directed information uh, with uh, transfer entropy like. And why we would like to use a higher order interaction? First of all, for practical reasons, because indeed, um, Grouping, uh, so if even if you have the computational power to condition to a huge a multivariate system, it's never a good idea to condition on singular variables. Because, for example, take the simplest case in which you want to find the influence between X and Y and see whether the influence between X and Y is mediated by Z or not. And so basically you do a model of Y uh, given X including Z or excluding Z. If the model gets worse, then you can say, okay, the information is conveyed through Z. So Z is a mediator. If it doesn't get worse, then you can say, okay, it's direct from X to Y. But what is the problem? If Z is not only one variable, but is Z1, Z2, Z3, which are correlated, but we don't know it in advance, then we remove Z1 from the model and the model does not get worse because there are still the Z2 and Z3, which convey the information from X to Y. 
and then we put it back Z1 and we remove Z2. And again, we say, okay, Z2 is not relevant because the model doesn't get worse. And then we remove Z3. And again, we say that it is not relevant. So we say, okay, neither Z1 nor Z2 nor Z3 mediate the information between X and Y in a significant way. So the information must be directed. On the other hand, it can be mediated by, by all the Z variables together. So uh, it's useful to group variables uh, in terms of their information content before conditioning. This also can allow to find uh, more information about how the system works. So, for example, there is a recent uh, work that uh, we uh, co-authored also with Vince, in which uh, we try to disambiguate the role of blood flow on one hand and global signal in the long-lasting uh, debate on global signal regression in fMRI using this partial information decomposition, or a recent work by uh, some colleagues, which uh, found in the role of synergy, so the joint information of two variables uh, with respect to a target uh, as a possible uh, core signature in both uh, structural and functional uh, neural networks, but also uh, genetics variables, uh, cognition, and so on. So, uh, I hope I uh, succeeded uh, in giving you an overview of how uh, information multivariate models can help in detecting interaction between different components of a complex system and how by knowing the advantages and the pitfalls of these methodologies, we can uh, ask better questions or give better answers to our uh, problems in neuroscience. Thank you. Thanks, Daniela. Thanks, thanks. That was, yeah, that was great. Um, so if uh, if anyone wants to ask a question, um, looks like we do have some. Yes, here. I do. I just have to access the chat. Yeah, so for, for fMRI, I can, I can read it to you. For fMRI, yeah. how, how sensitive is transfer entropy to errors in thresholding used to quantize the signal? Yeah, so uh, I guess that uh, Gopi is referring to the, the binning approach, right? So the classical transfer entropy in which uh, you uh, you don't assume a multivariate model, but uh, you um, you want to, uh, yes, okay, indeed. Uh, so the binning indeed uh, in, um, uh, in my experience, especially for a short uh, valued, uh, sorry, for a short, signals like the one we observe in fMRI is not a good uh, uh, strategy for um, uh, for computing transfer entropy. And I would say even more that for fMRI, I would really strongly uh, advise the use of uh, Gaussian approximation. Uh, so let's say drop the, the non-linearity assumptions. And by the way, uh, I don't mention this only because it goes in the direction of what I'm saying. Actually, I don't care. But uh, there was a paper by the group of Maurizio Corbetta uh, more than 10 years ago, which says that indeed for group studies in fMRI, uh, linear interactions are those which uh, matter. On the other hand, for example, for uh, magnetocephalography data, uh, there is this uh, phase transfer entropy. Uh, in that type of system, we care a lot about the phase. And especially for steady state responses, where we have really long uh, uh, time series and a, a lot of samples, then in that case, the binning works uh, works nicely. Uh, okay. okay, so this is one from Sergey. Uh, Sergey, uh, under sampling data. Uh, uh, yes, so under sampling data in. Uh, okay, I, I didn't know this uh, paper, Sergey. I will definitely look into it. So, uh, uh, so you think that it also applies to uh, steady state? Uh, Daniela, uh, Daniela, maybe read it because uh, I think that was a private chat to you, so others can't see it. Ah, okay, sorry. Yeah. So uh, basically, uh, Sergey was saying, um, "Hi, Daniela. Uh, uh, note under sampling data in any vector regressive like model will legitimately lead you to biased conclusions about the causal structure." Here is an entry point to the problem, if you weren't aware. And the, the entry point 
is uh, Amalgamating Evidence of Dynamics by David Danks and Sergey Pliss, uh, published in Synthes uh, in 2019. So uh, I will uh, definitely uh, look uh, uh, more to this data, and uh, I uh, don't understand if the, the question was that, let's say, this supports what I just said, that indeed downsampling leads to problems in transfer entropy, like uh, I said in uh, this... Uh, slide maybe i was too fast in this so the fact that indeed the downsampling elicits skull dependent causal interaction so it has a bad effect on uh, the downsampling steps or uh, you were saying that even in the state space formulation uh, this problem is present because in our simulation we observe that indeed the state space formulation uh, was solving this uh, problem but uh, it could be uh, not universal, let's say. Uh, okay, so uh, Armin, uh, uh, whether I can give some simple explanation on how common uh, functional connectivity measures can help with the causal uh, interpretability. Yeah, so in uh, in the paper by Andrew Reed uh, et al, which we published uh, it, uh, last year, uh, this one, Advancing Functional Connectivity Research from Association to Causation, you have uh, uh, several uh, examples. So, uh, for example, uh, if I can think about for, uh, an experiment in which you have a designed uh, modulation, uh, a designed intervention, uh, let's say, even if you don't know uh, exactly all the variables which contribute to the to the modulation, and even if you cannot measure at the same time from all the neurons and all the variables, let's say comparing the uh, the functional connectivity matrix, in particular, the mm. when we condition to other variables, and I would say more, if we uh, uh, try to group variables in the in their um, uh, amount of information they share on the system, we can see uh, the ones which are uh, the interactions which change uh, after the modulation and those which uh, who stay constant. In particular, uh, separating between the self information and the the cross information. Um, I have a question. Um, yep. which is, um, um, to what degree do you think um, multimodal information can help with causal modeling and um, what would be your sort of top uh, choice there? So, um, uh, let's start from, from the, the simplest one, let's say, uh, just without moving away from the MRI scanner. So, let's say by looking at the uh, functional and structural uh, connectivity, uh, there have been uh, quite some work uh, showing that Indeed, uh, uh, let's say the, there is basically one single uh, principal component which explains both uh, the, uh, this, the, the structural connectivity and the functional connectivity structure. On the other hand, it depends a lot on the size of the system because, for example, let's say uh, when we observe uh, different patterns of functional connectivity uh, underlying the same structural connectome, of course, uh, we need to uh, forget, let's say, some individual links. Uh, but, um, so we, we need to forget part of an underlying structure if we want to be better informed from the functional connectivity. So, for example, when People say, well, okay, uh, let's use functional connectivity to reconstruct the structural connectivity. It can be crucial in some uh, aspects, but certainly not for large scale uh, human neuroimaging. So, for example, uh, you would have learned uh, by uh, Dante Chiavo uh, last month, of course, all the theory of uh, brain criticality and so, and how, let's say, uh, the brain operates in this critical regime that if you want criticality is also the balance state between excitation and inhibition and and so on. So whenever you have some conservation, you have this long range correlation and those interesting things uh, happening. Uh, 
On the other hand, also the transfer entropy peaks at criticality. So the because one might wonder, okay, when the system is disordered, you have no um, transfer entropy. When the system is completely ordered, you have no uh, transfer entropy. And then at the uh, in the critical regime, both transfer entropy and uh, uh, correlation will have a maximum. But on the other hand, which one comes before? The transition to order or the transition in uh, uh, mutual information? So uh, the answer is the synergy. Uh, it's uh, something that unfortunately I wasn't able to, to put here, but uh, I will maybe send some material later. But this is to say that indeed in the critical regime, uh, in particular at the, at the point of uh, criticality when you uh, simulate uh, a system, basically the information transfer is maximized, but the similarity between functional and structural connectivity goes to a minimum. Also, the mean square error has a maximum, basically saying that you need to forget uh, uh, some of the individual links to uh, better uh, model the functional connectivity. And so in this sense, uh, it's crucial to consider this type of measures, both of them together and possibly also modeling to have a better characterization from a multimodal data because definitely you have uh, uh, different uh, amount of information and also uh, and complementary information. And uh, also in this uh, paper uh, by uh, uh, these colleagues, which came out, uh, let's say last month, uh, it also shows how indeed uh, uh, this uh, uh, higher order uh, informational quantities are robust across different types of, uh, of modalities. Mm -hmm. um, last question for me is um, what would, so given all the controversy about, uh, about functional connectivity in the name, what, what would your favorite name for it be if you were to relabel it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, indeed. Uh, so for me, uh, let's say I'm uh, I'm not a guy against functional in the sense that uh, we have to remind that it has been uh, defined at least in large scale human neuroimaging to uh, to contrast it with uh, with the structural uh, connectivity. So in this sense, I'm happy. To call it functional because uh, it uh, it is a, a complementary thing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we don't need to reconstruct the the white matter fibers looking at uh, the bold uh, signals because we can do it uh, already with uh, with our DTI. Even if even if the the diffusion uh, reconstruction is not perfect either. But uh, so let's say that. Um, uh, I don't mind call it functional as, uh, I don't know, uh, Pedro Valdezosa feels uh, much more strongly a bit, uh, with, a, uh, with the functional one. <laughs> and actually, uh, let's say before, um, there was a point in which I was happy to say, well, okay, let's drop all the causal language. Let's just call things uh, correlation, mutual information, whatever, which is perfectly fine. But then... Uh, all the bashers of causality maybe uh, touch too many sensitive points in my head, which I say, well, no, now it has to be everything causality. So if I want to troll these people, I would just call everything a causal connectivity, but then uh, <laughs> uh, I, I would maybe fine. not do it. <laughs> but let's say, let's say with function, let's say. Um, so just as a reminder to everyone, um, we are going to create or have already created a, um, a Slack channel uh, around this talk so that we can have follow up discussions. I know there's a, there's some other questions here. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so the one by Sergey is again yeah. on estimator. So I really have to, to look yeah. into it is uh, yep. um, yep. very, uh, I would say, uh, technical and a bit outside what I wanted to say today, but I will happy to so pull that in and we'll, we'll kind to, of paste that into the Slack so that we can um, kind Yeah, of definitely. That is a great thing. And indeed, I will uh, definitely get back there. Yeah, sounds very good. Um, and I just want to thank you for again for, for joining uh, us. Thanks to you. And, thanks uh, for being here and uh, yeah. thanks for the, for can, the invitation. We can still stay connected even though, you know, we're we're virtual. So uh, we'll, we'll keep this going and uh, yes, yes, point, yes, definitely. Yeah, you know, meet up and, and have some actual, uh, you know, coffee or 
beer or something. So yeah, 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 that would be great. Indeed. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Do you have anything else to, to that you wanted to add, Armin, before we sign no. off? No. No, okay. I appreciate it. Right. So we can continue on the Slack and we yes, can indeed. I will uh, update the Slack too. Okay, I will look uh, at the um, at my notifications and hopefully uh, get back to you with the uh, sure. uh, with everything. Okay, Thank thanks you. a okay. lot. Thanks, Daniela. Stay safe. Bye bye. Everybody later. Thanks. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.